Fernando Perla, and I am an independent consultant, curator, um, and human rights advocate. I am connecting today from the traditional unceded territory of the Ganengeha Nation uh, or Yajage, Montreal. Um, and I am also a member, a board member of the International Committee on Ethical Dilemmas for uh, the International Council of Muslims. Today, um, we will be talking about making space for historically excluded voices, uh, but I want to start uh, before going into details, I want to start by talking a little bit about um, colonization and decolonization, what those mean. Uh, so give a little bit of a theoretical framework at the beginning, and then I want to also look at some um, very specific um, cases on how we can uh, decolonize uh, practice in the arts and a little bit of the museum sector as well, but mostly um, looking at decolonization through the lens of um, uh, community work. And so with that, um, I want to start by situating us right now in this historic moment that we're living. So, um, I mean, we are experiencing these concurrent crises, um, health crisis, economic crisis, but also a social crisis, um, which have revealed, uh, you know, the shock and uh, impoverishment of existing uh, sectors of our society, so civil, political, economic, social, and cultural. Um, so what we've also seen because of uh, this crisis is that we have is that those who were already vulnerable must now fight to simply stay alive. This is very important, right? Because um, these vulnerable groups have been disproportionately affected by this crisis. We're talking about um, people like the elderly asylum seekers, refugees, racialized people, members from the LGBT community, uh, undocumented workers, low income uh, people, but also people um, experiencing homeless. And this is the result of the systems that you know our society has built and created. So I want to look a little bit of uh, why the systems exist. Of course, this has really made us rethink the way that we think as cultural workers, um, not only, like I said, the way that we work, but also the way that we live. So all of this, you know, has really come to shift our ways of uh, doing uh, and thinking. So in, under this context, um, you know, the way that cultural institutions in the sector maintain and perpetuate inequality and oppression is something that we really need to look at. And this is why I want to start, like I said, with you know, looking at um, colon colonization uh, and decolonization in, in, in that sense. So for, you know, before we start, I guess we have to sort of like talk about what colonization means. And colonization, um, according to, you know, Walter Mignolo and Catherine Walsh, um, is the process of European invasion that created a social classification based on the false idea of race, um, imposed an oppressive system of white supremacy, dispossession of land and wealth, and established policies of genocide and enslavement. So I'm going to go a little bit more into detail about this as well, and then what I mean um, by white supremacy. So white supremacy is at the base of colonization. This is what uh, Maori lawyer um, Moana Jackson also tells us. And I want to look at uh, this idea because sometimes when we think about white supremacy, we immediately think of you know KKK or like this very extremist set of positions of white supremacy. But what I mean by white supremacy, as um, Jamaican scholar Charles uh, Mills explained, it's the unnamed political system that has made the modern world what it is today. A system of European global domination bringing into existence whites and non-whites, full persons and subpersons. And this is important because when I say invisible, it's because this has become so much the default that we don't even think about it, right? This is the way that we think, that we act, and it's all ingrained into this society structures, where, like we said, have affected very much, uh, or where, um, like I said, revealed even more with this concurrent crisis. Um, so again, uh, Moana Jackson tells us that, uh, explains a little bit further, right? And tells us that, some of Europe's greatest thinkers contributed to the development of this presumption, and it eventually encompassed everything from the superiority of their form of government to the greater reason of their minds and even the beauty of their bodies. They were merely warped fantasies posing as fact, but they were eventually learned as the truth that enabled Europeans to assert that they had the right to take over the lands, lives, and, the pow and, and, and power over those who they had decided were the lesser breeds. That we don't see it like this clearly spelled out, you know, in our everyday lives, 
but these remnants of these systems are still very much present in everything that we do. And we'll look a little bit more about that. So I also wanted to look a little bit, uh, you know, like the history of colonization uh, in Finland, which I know very much like Scandinavian nations. Sometimes we have this um, idea that uh, these are countries that were not really directly involved with the colonization project, but there is research that has been done, uh, especially at the University of Turkey. There is a whole group on uh, Finland and uh, the links to the colonial project, which you know I encourage you to go and look at as well. Um, and for example, uh, Professor Suvi uh, Keskinen tells us that uh, yeah, this whole concept of um, you know European countries that never had overseas colonies were also involved in the colonial world. They sent out colonizers and reproduce as well images of colonial authors. So this is important, right? Because it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, that these countries needed to have very ingrained and strong colonies. They were still reproducing these um, ways of thinking and doing that we have just uh, looked at as well. So this is known as uh, colonial complicity and colonialism without colonies. And so this is these are concepts that were developed to examine European societies and countries, which were not classical colonial powers, but which nevertheless were involved in and affected by colonialism. Finland adapted ideologies and identities that are not easy to disentangle from colonialism. This is a well disentangling. These notions from colonialism is something that Mignolo and Walsh also talk about. Um, so the Finns were not only passive victims of Russian uh, imperial rule, but also active participants in the creation of imperial vocabulary in various colonial contexts. This is what uh, Professor Suvi you know, uh, tells us. Um, they benefited economically from colonialism as well, sent out missionaries to spread the ideas of Western white Christianity, uh, Christian superiority, and were involved in various colonial enterprises. So for example, the majority of um, colonizers that were sent to New, C New Sweden were uh, Finnish. And that's what is uh, today uh, Delaware in the United States. Here we can see, you know, this image of a poster celebrating the 300th anniversary of, the, you know, <laughs> the arrival of uh, Finn, uh, Finn colon, uh, colonizers uh, to, to New Sweden. Um, Finns adopted and adapted and created uh, common European knowledge as well about the colonized areas, cultures, and people, and participated in constructing uh, racial hierarchies. Sweden also contributed a lot to the creation of these racial hierarchies through lineas. Uh, and so this was also adopted um, in, in Finland. So like I said, I will not go into much more detail into this uh, because I'm not an expert obviously on uh, colonialism in Finland, but you can go and look at, uh, there is quite a bit of material uh, from this project, like I said, at the University of Finland. I also want to look at what decolonization means because before we get into like, you know, the, the, <laughs> the concrete examples. Um, and so decolonization um, can mean a lot of things, but um, generally is thought about being a process of deconstructing colonial ideologies of superiority and privilege to Western thought and approaches. So what we saw you know, earlier um, during the presentation. On the one hand, decolonization involves dismantling structures that perpetuate the status quo and addressing unbalanced power dynamics. So that status quo is that invisible system that we saw as well. Um, on the other hand, Decolonization involves valuing and re revitalizing indigenous knowledge and approaches and weeding out settler biases or assumptions that have impacted indigenous way ways of being. This is the disentangling that we talked about as well. And I want you to keep in mind this revitalization concept of indigenous knowledge because I will come back uh, in, in a second with a more practical example from Finland as well. For non-Indigenous people, decolonization is the process of examining beliefs about Indigenous peoples and culture by learning about themselves in relation to the communities where they live and the people with whom they, in, they interact. Um, so it's important as well to notice that um, colonization did not only affect Indigenous peoples, but affect you know, all of those who are outside of what uh, Western uh, thought saw as humans uh, and create, you know, by creating that category of subhuman. So here we also looked at other people who were racialized. Uh, of course, black people and slave people, you know, who were brought from Africa to the different colonies. We're also looking at um, people from different uh, sexual orientations and gender identities that did also not fit within that uh, Christian, you know, model of uh, gender binaries, sexual orientation as well. So everyone who fell outside of that sort of, um, you know, uh, the, the colonial sort of like framework, right? Like 
this uh, colonization affected all of those people, so decolonization as well must affect all of these groups. I wanted to look at three uh, Sami artists uh, from Finland because again, uh, colonization uh, or the ties from Finland to the colonial project aren't just because of like I said, colonies or the sending of you know uh, missionaries and all of that and absorbing all of the knowledge from uh, Western thought, but also um, in relation to the Sami population uh, in Finland. Um, and so I want to look at uh, three artists who have done um, a lot of work in relation to decolonizing, you know, uh, their practices, but also decolonizing the places where they've existed and where they live. Um, and so first I wanted to, look, they're from three different generations as well. Um, so I wanted to look first at uh, Niels Aslak. And of course, uh, he was very important because he was part of this big um, Sami Renaissance period in Finland. Um, all he worked, he was very multifaceted, so he worked with a lot of different medium. Um, and here we see a painting, but also he was very key in the revitalization uh, in uh, recuperating, I guess, or bringing back um, of uh, the yoik. So that's also very important because like, you know, we saw in what decolonization means, it means the rev revitalization of um, indigenous knowledges, artistic practices and cultures. Well. So uh, Niels Aus, like uh, Jimmy is a very good example of that. So then I wanted to look at Uti uh, Pieski, and I mean, you will forgive me for my pronunciation because I'm not very good in uh, Finnish, but um, she is also a Sami artist who, um, you know, differently than uh, Niels asked, like she was struggling quite a bit with embracing her Sami um, identity because of the way that colonization uh, worked in uh, Finland, of course, right? Like, so uh, the taking of the children and put into like the school systems, the, you know, trying to sort of like um, integrate Sami children into main society, all of that affected, but also the imposition of Christianity. You know, we talked about uh, that as well and how it affected um, a lot of um, the people who were colonized. Um, so yes, so she in her work makes particular reference to that oppression from Christianity. You can see it here. I mean, this is works, you know, where the, we can see the devil, right? In, um, or it's the Cerveri, I think it's like the dog with like the multiple heads that sort of guards the um, gates to hell. But so she was very conflicted and, 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 and had these feelings that were like spawning from uh, this whole baggage of you know, colonization and her identity as Sami. And the last one that I wanted to look at was uh, Merya. And I would say, you know, the other <laughs> names because I don't know how to pronounce them. Um, so she also makes an effort to go back to the, you know, the areas where Sami culture is alive and thriving to be able to sort of like um, reclaim these identities and work with that. And she moves back and forth between. Uh, and there's also works in, in, in a series that she has uh, developed that are called going back to rematriation, I believe it will be the uh, translation or the name in English. And so I, I thought like, she was a really good example as well of the decolonization. Uh, and, and I'm gonna get back as well to these concepts of what it means, um, and especially for those who have been colonized and for indigenous peoples, but you know, at the end of the day, decolonization means uh, being able to tell uh, uh, their own stories or our own stories. I don't want to romanticize decolonization because we really need to think critically about decolonization as well. Um, and I wanted to bring here the thoughts of, uh, of course, you know, uh, Sumaya Kasim, which I'm pretty sure everyone knows uh, her very famous essay now, the museum will not be decolonized. Um, and she tells us that decolonizing is uh, deeper than just being represented. So this is very important. When projects and institutions proclaim a commitment to diversity, inclusion, or decoloniality, we need to attend to these claims with a critical eye. Decoloniality is a complex set of ideas. It requires complex processes, uh, space, money, and time. Otherwise, it turns the risk of becoming another buzzword like diversity. This is very important because, you know, like Angela Davis also says, diversity is that difference that doesn't make a difference, you know, and, and it's sort of like this way to for institutions to sort of like vaccinate themselves. So they bring a little bit of this, you know, uh, new faith, this brown and black or indigenous faces, and they continue to do uh, things the way that they've always done. So I think this is important. And then 
Um, of course, Paul Whitecairns, who is fantastic from the National Museum of New Zealand, uh, Te Papa. Um, she tells us that I have had a long held resentment of the theory of decolonization because of this uh, expectation on me to modify and change while the colonial system remains the same. Decolonizing can be colonization at its most insidious. This is very important. Um, so the option of decolonization as the latest trendy cultural theory and praxis run the very real danger of locking indigenous people in a death dance with colonial structures with its demands that we work and labor until we are completely consumed. So like I said, this is important because a lot of the times, you know, we hear uh, institutions or people groups, you know, artists being like, oh, we want to decolonize our practice. We want to decolonize our institutions. So we need to go and get these indigenous people or these, you know, people who have been the colonial author to do that work, to help us do that work. But in doing this, we are also putting a lot of demand on these people to do that work. And why are we doing this? Is it because we want to be in line with the new trends, you know, like for why it says here, because we want to be in fashion, like also Sumaya Kassim tells us with, you know, like diversity, all of this stuff, or is it because we really want to give, you know, uh, the opportunity for these people who have been colonized to tell their stories in their own time. So this is important as well to ask ourselves. Um, so again, yeah, decolonization is a means to an end. So the terms decolonization and indigenization are only a means to a more far-sighted horizon. They are not our goal, but present possi possibly better ways of achieving a different system and environment for indigenous people. Ultimately, we are searching for a future where lived experiences of being Maori, where our relation to our material culture is respected and honored on our own terms. We are searching for mana motuhake, for our own cultural autonomy. This is what's key, because like I said, the key to decolonization is that cultural autonomy that is given or that is returned back to uh, the colonized other, right? It is not about us decolonizing our practices to tell the stories of other people or people who have been colonized, but it's about creating alliances. It's about working together to be able to create those spaces where these voices are autonomous. This concept of autonomy is a very, very important. It just, this is related again to self-determination. In her book, Decolonizing Methodologies, Research and Indigenous Peoples, um, Maori professor Linda Tuhuwai Smith also tells us that the need to tell our stories remains the powerful imperative of a powerful form of resistance. I'm gonna talk about three different um, examples. So the first one that I want to talk about is uh, a community in uh, Mexico, in Huajotzingo, in Puebla, um, close to Puebla. And this is a group uh, that is really, really interesting. I first met them, um, I guess back in 2018, 17, probably. Um, so I was uh, giving a talk in Mexico um, about um, ethics of oral history and different projects. And at the end of the talk, I had this couple of youth who came to talk to me about a project that they were doing, a project about um, their carnival. So these are uh, photographs that I took uh, last year when I was able to visit the carnival. And uh, what I really like about this community is that uh, they have really taken uh, that task of telling their own stories. Well, so what they told me is that a lot of that research and a lot of the knowledge that has been produced has not been produced by people from the community. It has been produced by external um, you know, parties like our anthropologists, uh, all these people coming, taking photos or doing research on them, not with them. Um, and so what they wanted to do is that they wanted to find all these different ways or what they were already doing is finding these different ways on how they could reclaim those narratives and tell their stories on their own terms. So one of the things that they were really worried about is that um, a lot of this knowledge is held with their elders and their elders were uh, passing away and they were, and that knowledge was being lost. So they had initiated um, sort of an oral history project to be able to collect that knowledge and to have that knowledge, but they used it also in uh, different ways. But they connected with all the different artists, all that from the community, all across the board. And so this is a way in which they have taken um, bits and pieces from those oral histories that they have done with 
met with their elders and were the people in their community and they partner with uh, artists. Here we can see, um, you know, they're doing workshops, they're bringing youth, the youth from the town, they're bringing them to learn from the, uh, the local artists how to do the leather masks. So this is, these are, this um, knowledge is passed, you know, through uh, families. And so they've also bring in the youth to like, so they can keep learning. And so this knowledge is not lost, how they, it's not just a mask, but it's also all the other parts of the costume, like how to do, you know, like the regalia that they put on, how to do the feathers, uh, how to do the rifles. Here you have uh, Karen, you know, who's one of those two uh, people who approached me first after the conference in the bottom uh, right corner, talking, you know, showing again, some of the images, some of the art that they've done on the wall, um, and talking to children so they know about their heritage and their culture. What is amazing is that they also did um, this museum, they opened it in one of their houses. So, you know, people during the carnival, they can come in and out and they do all this programming and all of, you know, for children. But this is just one thing again, uh, like I said, the whole town is the museum. Um, so here you can also see another way that they are retelling their stories on their own. This is Karen, uh, again, working on embroidery. This is part of the regalia. This is part of the costume. There are two, I guess, types of carnivals in Mexico, I should have um, said. Uh, so the largest one and the more mainstream, which is known like, you know, like will be Mardi Gras or like all of those, it's the Carnaval of Veracruz in Mexico, but there's also a second set of carnivals, which are much more uh, community oriented. And these are the ones that bring all of these indigenous traditions as well into it. And the largest one from those types of carnival is the Carnaval of Huejotzingo, which is the one we're, we're seeing here. So this is like, again, part of um, their uh, regalia and part of the art that they're trying to reclaim as well. So here uh, you can see the costume, uh, David, who is another one, you know, he's the other youth that came to me when I was uh, in, in Puebla giving the conference. We can see him putting uh, the, they have this tradition, like every year they do that and, you know, he dresses, Karen and Karen helps him get dressed. And another thing that I wanted to show uh, was, for example, here in the top uh, left corner, we see Karen and David again, um, you know, an embrace. But then also uh, the artists who they partner with, you know, they love that image and they love, you know, like uh, their commitment to each other, but also the commitment to the carnival. So they took that and they made it into a mural. So mural is another thing Thing that is really really important because like i said the whole town is the museum and you can see murals on all the streets and all the walls of the town uh, and again and it shows the commitment of these youth to their carnival and to their town and their commitment to art because they're also the ones who brought all of these artists you know all these muralists the muralism as we know it's a very big has been a very big movement in mexico and in in, in the art history of Mexico, tons of murals, but I wanted to show some of the many murals that uh, you can see when you're walking on the streets of the town in Wojotzingo. And there are like many more, right? But here you can see some of the artists working on them. And this is all, again, created by Colectivo Ache, which is the name of the collective that Karen and David are part of with all their youth of the town. And they bring, like I said, all these artists to create all these amazing uh, projects. Um, so another uh, thing, and this is, uh, I love this, this is David here in this photo, and they, uh, during the pandemic, uh, they had these wonderful ideas, and they said, uh, we've been thinking that we would probably like to do an outdoors exhibition, so get some photographs from uh, different archives that they've been researching and that they've identified that have these collections, um, and uh, we would like to have them um, display outdoors so people can walk around so they don't have to go into a space, uh, you know, small space during the pandemic, but they can look at them from the outside. And, and, and I said, well, it might be, maybe in, 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 um, in a practical sense, it might be difficult, especially if you have to go and print and all of this during the pandemic. So maybe let's think about something that can be done easier. So we thought about, we, we came to the realization that it probably would be easier to project the images on the walls of the different houses. There are four neighborhoods in uh, the town of Huejotzingo, and each neighborhood has a different 
um, set as well of uh, celebrating the carnival with their battalions. So then, you know, they were connecting with all of the people. They've connected, they've done all this work going, you know, like door to door, knocking to people, getting them to um, give them photographs or this and that. And so, I mean, they've done all that work. But these collections of photographs, for example, that they really wanted to start with, where all of these uh, photos that had been taken, like I said earlier, like last century or two centuries ago, from uh, images that anthropologists outside of the community had taken. Um, and yeah, of course, probably with no consent, you know, in those times. So here we can see one of those images, um, which is hosted in a foundation in Mexico. So it's uh, the Haraka Foundation. Um, and so they wanted to work with them. And they also, uh, found other collections uh, in two museums in Europe. Wanted to, uh, again, just look at here what um, Toni Morrison, you know, says in, in, you know, in the white gaze, right? Like, which she tells us that our lives have no meaning, no depth without the white gaze. And I have spent my entire writing life trying to make sure that the white gaze was not the dominant one. I took this quote because I thought it was important in relation to what they were trying to do in Wilho Tingo. Because like I said, these images have been taken from people who are external to the community, but they wanted to put them in conversation with the community. So they wanted to contextualize them through the voices of the community, something that has never been done. So this was another really nice way to use this photograph, this art form, and then bring it into conversation with the voices of the community for them to be able to tell their own story because the story was being told without them. But they also did this research and they found another collection of photographs in, uh, that was, that's hosted at the World Culture Museums in Sweden. Um, because, you know, the World Culture Museums in Sweden has the largest collection of uh, artifacts or belongings uh, from uh, the Americas um, in Northern uh, Europe. So the photo, the image that you see here on the left is an image that was taken by uh, Budel Christensen, uh, who was an, a Swedish anthropologist who left her collection to the World Culture Museum. So in the research that they used, you know, that Karen and David and the collective, collective Ache uh, have been doing, they found this collection. So I was able to put them in touch with the curator who looks after this collection at the World Culture Museum. And uh, then she also led us to another collection that is in the ethnographic, the National Ethnographic Museum of the Netherlands. So the image on the right comes from that collection. These images, this is the intangible heritage of this community, which is not with them. A lot of the community members have never even seen these images. And so they wanted to bring them back, right? But what was interesting to me is that once we started talking to the museums uh, in Sweden and the Netherlands, well, the first one, you know, in Sweden um, told them, yeah, well, we can give you access to this many images for free, but after that, you have to pay a thousand kroner per image, which this is a very small community we have no resources, right? And so all of this started to like make us think, okay, we need to start really thinking about repatriation as well. And, and so that now we're going to do like a whole seminar of uh, repatriation of indigenous heritage, well, um, ceremonial objects, human remains, and uh, intangible heritage that is going to start in a month, uh, also originated because of this. They're also, like I said, are going door to door, knocking in their own communities and asking their neighbors to uh, see if they have their own collections. And these images are from the collections of, you know, the neighbors in town. So they've also, and so they were going to as well put them in conversation with the other photos so mix them and match them, right? With the other ones uh, during the exhibition and the projection. Um, yeah, they, like I said, they really do just amazing work. The other one uh, case that I wanted to talk about was an exhibition that I work with for the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. And, and this was, was done with uh, the Rohingya community. And it's also uh, an exhibition that is about photography. And I will talk a little bit about uh, some of um, the ethical dilemmas or ethical concerns that come from working uh, with um, historically marginalized communities. Uh, you know, the example that we just looked at uh, from the carnival in Huachingo, that is, a, I mean, that is, to me, that's like the ideal case and how you work because everything is being led by the community. Example now here with uh, the Rohingya community, I think it's, uh, it's an in-between because the community initiated 
they had this desire to do something and they came to an institution, but then you have to deal with the institution, right? And you have to deal with those politics and those uh, colonial ways of doing and thinking that we looked at. And so I wanna talk about a little bit about, about uh, as well about these challenges of working with the community when, um, you know, it's not like the case before where like it is complete autonomy, but you also have to be mindful of working with uh, people who are external to the community uh, and who have control of the final product. Uh, so the story behind this exhibition, uh, as you are pretty well aware, I am sure, is uh, the ongoing genocide in uh, Burma right now against the Rohingya people. Um, we've seen it all over the news. We've seen Aung San Suu Kyi, who, you know, uh, denied uh, the existence of a genocide, denied the existence of the Rohingya people. The Rohingya community started arriving in Canada in the 1990s, and there are a lot of families in a few different places of the country. There's settlements of Rohingya um, families here that are, you know, uh, changing also the way that um, the community looks like in, in these different parts of Canada and who are very strong and very like vibrant uh, presence in the country. And so they um, also have a presence in Winnipeg, which is the city where the Canadian Museum for Human Rights is located. And what happens is that they came to the museum and they look at San Sun Xi being represented as a human rights defender in some of the exhibitions at the museum because, you know, like, I mean, she had received like all of this awards and prizes all around the world. And so she was their feature. And this was very hurtful for the community. So they came to the museum and they asked the museum to address that and to remove those images of Aung San Suu Kyi from the museum. But also they um, talk about how their story was not represented, you know, in the museum and they wanted to see more content. So here's when it comes to the tricky part and the challenging part, because when you're involving institutions, right? So the museum uh, formed this committee. I was part of the committee, but then um, there was also different layers of it and leadership within the museum. The top uh, leadership decided that there was going to be an exhibition developed about, not with, this is important, about the genocide, about what was happening, about the community. Um, and to me, this was very troubling and this was very challenging because again, we, as an institution, as a museum, were deciding, we're going to tell that story for that community, which goes against completely, right, on what we've talked about, the decolonizing, the giving autonomy to, like, you know, people to tell their stories. And the museum decided that they were going to use the photograph of a well-known Canadian photographer who won the time award for best photography because he went and started photographing the community when they were fleeing. Burma and going into the refugee camps in Bangladesh. I wanted to read this uh, quote by Susan Sankton because I believe that this uh, speaks very clearly to some of the things that I was feeling, you know, when I was looking at this process sort of like unfold. And uh, she tells us that uh, in her book on photography, that it seems exploitative to look at harrowing photographs of other people's pain in an art gallery even those ultimate images whose gravity, whose emotional power seems fixed for all time. A portrait that declines to name a subject becomes complicit, if inadvertently in the cult of celebrity that has fueled an insatiable appetite for the opposite sort of photograph. To grant only the famous, their names, demotes the rest to representative instances of their occupations, their ethnicities, their plight, making suffering loom larger by globalizing it, by spur people to feel they ought to care more. It also invites them to feel that the sufferings and misfortunes are too vast, too irrevocable, too epic to be much changed by any local political intervention. With a subject conceived on this scale, compassion can only flounder and make abstract. To me, this really encompassed a lot of, like I said, the trouble and the issues that I had inside because the museum said that they wanted to do an art gallery type exhibition with the photographs, black and white, white walls, no text, no context, no nothing. So it's exactly, you know, what 
Susan Tonka, for example, here tells us that we should not be doing. And um, to me, there were also so many layers because again, this is a racialized minority that is experiencing this forced migration, that is experiencing genocide. And I felt that in the team of the museum, there was no racialized people who would have lived experience on uh, forced migration, except for me. I arrived in Canada as an asylum seeker, as a refugee. So I, this is why I'm also very, you know, um, careful about the way that I work with communities and the way that we present their work and that we present their stories, right? And how we can do that um, in, in collaboration is something that is really, really important to me. So to me in here, going back to the why gaze, uh, you know, quote from Toni Morrison, one of the things that worried me is that there was a triple white gaze in here. So the first white gaze was the gaze of the photographer, you know, that was looking at the community. The second white gaze was the white gaze of the museum team. All of the museum's team, everyone working on this exhibition with my exception, were also white. And then the third, which is also referred to here in, in, in Susan Sontag's uh, quote, was the audience because the majority of the audience that comes to the museum or to galleries are also white. And so why are we doing this? Are we telling the story because we are going to feed it as entertainment to a white audience? Or is it because is it going to really benefit that community? So that's always a question that I have in mind when I start working with a community in a project is how is this going to benefit that community? Like how is how are we going to center the needs of that community before the needs of myself as a curator, as an institution, or maybe as an artist. So some of the things that I did um, and try to, again, look at ways to decolonize the process of curation, but also working with the community was to um, immediately go and reach out to the community and talk, started to show uh, the images from uh, the photograph to them and asking them how they wanted to tell their story. They all said that the, the images were very powerful. The images um, were important to show because they did show the suffering of a big part of what was happening, but they only show one part of the story, which is the victimization, which is the victim part. And they wanted to tell a more complete and wholesome story. They also asked if they could choose the photographer because they had been working with a photographer who wasn't from the community, but who had established a very good relationship with them. But the museum did not want that photographer. So the museum was very much like stuck into we're going to show these images. So we needed to work with that. And so, but the community said, we want people to know that we are, we want visitors to know that we are a people, that we have a history, that we are wholesome human beings, that we built cities in Burma, that we built mosques, you know, that we had markets, that we have culture, poetry, like song, music, like all of these things. You can't see that from the images. The only thing that you can see is us as victims. They also echoed and they said, when people only see us as that, it's easier to dehumanize us and to not think of us as people, as human beings. And this is exactly what the genocide is doing. So we want to go against that. And so we started uh, talking about how we could do this and we landed on uh, this idea of creating an oral history project. I really like working with oral history because again, it allows us to bring all these different voices into a project. And it also allows us to create other forms of art. I mean, with oral history, you can do, I've, I've done uh, virtual reality, art, but also uh, choreography and dance, uh, you know, ballet, contemporary, uh, can, you can do theater, you can do like so many things also based from the oral history. But another thing that oral history allows you to do is to dig deeper into those voices from the communities. One thing that you also uh, have to be aware of is that when you're working with communities, usually in the first encounter, you will find the top layer of leadership within the community, which usually is men. And so we want to be able to get to all, so through all, creating projects with oral history that will allows you to go deeper into other, to talk to different uh, types, to talk to women, to talk to youth, to talk to all you know, people from like the LGBT communities within those uh, communities. So it allows you to really expand those voices and that vision that you have for a project. So we had many of these strategic meetings you know, over uh, a year 
uh, or during the process of developing the exhibition. Um, so here, this is one photo from like the first meeting that we had in Vancouver. And then we went around uh, the country developing, like I said, all these um, oral histories. We also created a curatorial committee. So instead of me as the curator selecting and choosing the images that were going to be shown in gallery, we instead, uh, what, I, what I did was to create this committee, which was five members of the community. Um, again, looking at gender balance, like all, you know, geographically and all of that. So they could be the ones choosing the images. So again, you know, I was trying to really minimize like the influence of external people within the work that we were doing. And so by them selecting the images, I also asked them to tell me, I asked them to tell me why these images were important to them, why they spoke to them, and to write that down. We use that as context for the images. So instead of having no context, no labels, no text, we use those words as the contextualization for the images in the gallery. Again, to put them in conversation and to bring those voices from the community. Um, and here uh, you can see, again, uh, a lot of uh, you know, the travels that we did across the country. Something that was important as well is that you can see that when we are doing these interviews, it's the community who are doing the interviews. So the questioners, uh, the questions that were asked, um, you know, who the participants were, how they were selected, where the interviews were conducted, like all of that, that was selected as well with the community, not by me as a curator or by the museum. What was really important is that, and this is what I call curatorial um, activism as well, is that I, as a curator, was working together with the community coming and advocating for these things inside of the museum. So together we were like asking and pushing for these things. And so the museum was, you know, in a way, corner to be able to listen and to, to do these things. And this is an, another thing that is important when I look at the food, and this is why I have this photo here, is because we build friendships. We, I mean, with all of these communities, right? Like you need to earn their trust because you can't just go and expect them to trust you and to work with you and give you their stories, which are the most harrowing stories that they probably experienced, right? We had so many wonderful barbecues outdoors, you know, when we were working all this delicious Rohingya food. Um, and yeah, and building, you know, I remember all of those dinners, all of those conversations, creating, building those relations. That is what is important, right? And this is also something that it, it, it's important to understand what we work with communities and we want to decolonize these processes as well because sometimes as researchers people like try to stay distant and try to keep that objectivity and it's like you know the subjects of that investigation you know? but when we're talking about decolonization it's a completely different thing I mean these are all my friends right so it's, it's, I continue to be in touch with them and this is also something that is important to know because when you're working with communities you're gonna get calls sometimes in the middle of the night you're gonna like people like they will ask from you, they will demand things from you. Because again, this is important because we are all benefiting from this, from telling this story. As museum professionals, as artists, you know, like all of that, we get paid for this. This to me is also part of that reciprocity because people trust you with those stories. And then, you know, yes, they will call you, they will like you, and they will ask things and you have to be there, right? Because again, this is a relationship of trust that you're building. Um, so this is also important because it's, it's, it's working with communities is challenging, but it is also amazingly rewarding. And so this is, uh, again, looking at how the exhibition looked like. Uh, so here now you can see, again, like, you know, uh, here I can go with how it was difficult to work. I left the museum because I moved to Sweden to work in a different project in the middle of, the, but the community still asked me to stay. So I stayed, you know, even in Sweden, working as the curator here, I came back and continue to work with the community because again, it was important to keep that relationship and to not break that trust that had been given on me just by leaving the project. And this is something that, you know, people um, sometimes said to me, even in Sweden, they would say, yeah, but those relationships are the museums. And I said, no, those relationships are relationships I built. These people trusted me, not the institution. So the museum was very much fixed into having the center point of the exhibition to be the photographs taken by um, that photographer. 
Um, but again, like I said, through the oral histories, through the contextualization, we were able to at least put them in conversation. Here you can see some of those quotes. They are the ones that you know we were able to gather from the community. So they give some context. And like I said, the community also said, we have our own photographs. We have taken photographs ourselves. So we want those images to be seen inside of the exhibition. And so that was another big part of advocacy to bring those photos into the exhibition, but that battle we won. And so you can see here, for example, when we see the photographs in the left, which are the ones from the external photographer and the ones on the right, which are the ones from the community, you see the difference. They're in color. They're like much more about agency. They're children playing. It's not about the suffering so much, right? Like it's about them as human beings, as a community. We used it to develop um, also um, a part of the exhibition that was based uh, or that was using uh, artificial intelligence. So people will come and ask questions from the you know, screen and the answers that they would receive were answers that were taken from uh, the oral histories as well that we did. So that, that was another way to bring those voices into the exhibition, right? And not only to have that gaze and that um, sort of like um, vision from the photographer. Um, so this was the opening of the exhibition, which again, it was also really interesting because um, for the first time from the, in the history of the museum, this uh, opening was led completely by the community. So there was only two people who were external to the community who spoke at the, at the opening of the exhibition, even I as the curator, you know, I did not speak because I didn't want to tell that story. It wasn't my story to tell. The curatorial committee that I organized also became a programming committee. So all of the programming around the exhibition was also developed by them and led by them. Um, and so, for example, for the opening, uh, we had a recital you know, from the with the children from the community, we had a theater as well with the youth from the community. We had music. We had all of these things that were led, and it was the first time that the museum had done something like that. And you could tell with the people, you know, who were um, in attendance that they were so moved and they were so happy to see this happening. The main thing that you know the museum wanted to highlight again was still the photographs of you know the black and white photographs. So that was the main part of the gallery. And the content, the original content was sort of like put in this corner, which, you know, we felt, mm, yeah, it's not what we wanted, but still it was, it was seen as a victory because otherwise it would have just been, you know, like the photographs with no text or nothing. Um, but I'm saying this because it's important that once that ribbon cut and opened all of the people who were there, they just immediately went through, they passed through all of those black and white photographs and they went immediately to the corner. And this is again, going back to how is the community benefiting from this? What was really important for this community was to raise awareness about the genocide that is happening to their people in Burma. And this is what they wanted. That was the main objective. And so they were the ones who were able to talk to the media and to tell their story and to talk about the advocacy and what, what needed to be done, what Canada as a government, as a country should be doing. They were all of the ones telling all of that to the news, right? And that was a big part of, that was the victory that we saw. But that's important why, you know, we need to have those advocates inside of institutions as well. And people who understand, uh, or artists who understand how to work with these communities. So this is uh, the last example I want to talk about, which is called Weaving a Better Future. And uh, it is an example from a community in uh, Guatemala that I also work with, um, with the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. So this is again, another example when uh, it is difficult to work because you're working through an institution. Central America experienced all of this um, civil war um, <clears throat> conflicts, armed conflict during the eighties, they've been, they were fueled by the United States. Uh, there were genocides that took place uh, in, in the region, like all of these things. I am a product as well. You know, I grew up during the war in El Salvador. Um, so next door to Guatemala. But what happened in Guatemala is that during the war, especially in the, between 1981 and 1983, uh, there was a genocide that was committed against indigenous people of Guatemala. So the Maya, many of the Maya people uh, in there. So a lot of the men were disappeared uh, or killed. And this left a lot of the women on their own uh, and trying to find ways to sort of um, look after themselves and to find ways to provide for their families, right? And so because they're weavers, because they're artists, um, they initiated these cooperatives uh, of artisans to be able to, again, also 
reclaim uh, their knowledge because during the genocide, because if you were indigenous, you were a target. So a lot of people stopped wearing their traditional costumes. They stopped weaving and all of that. So with the cooperatives, uh, they also try to recover um, this knowledge. They you know, try to like bring back like the pride of uh, their indigeneity, but also um, it serves as a collective way of healing for the women uh, when they were working together in these cooperatives because they realized as well that they were not alone, that this had happened to many of them. So this is sort of the background for these cooperatives. This project came about because the museum, again, we were doing an exhibition on women's cooperatives from around the world. And the president of the museum wanted to do a virtual reality exhibition uh, on one of the, 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 the women cooperatives, the one from Rwanda. And they told me when I came back, you're gonna go to Rwanda and you're going to do this um, project with you know, the women's and the virtual reality in there. And I said, I don't feel comfortable doing that because first of all, I've never been to Rwanda. I do not have any relations with uh, the women's and their communities. And I cannot go and ask them to share with me the most troubling, the most traumatizing experience of their lives, which is the experience of genocide with me, who I'm a complete stranger. So I did not feel that was ethical for me to do. So I said, and I said, but I can talk to them and see if they might be interested in uh, working with us and what this can you know, come about. And so they said, okay, yeah, do that. And it took me a few months to start, you know, to build that relationship of trust with the women. And so of course, you know, like, you know, when I initially started talking to them, they will say to me, well, you know, why? Why are we going to do this? Uh, who are you, like, like me, but who is this institution? Who is this, this museum that wants to show our stories? We don't trust, they said to me, filmmakers, artists, all these people that come here because we've had them coming for years and years and years, taking our knowledge, taking our, you know, uh, art and everything and, and appropriating it. And they leave with our stories, with our art, and they never come back. And we don't know how our stories and how our art is being used. And everyone is profiting from it. Everyone is making money except for us. They said, and we are here like trying to survive. And so this is important. I mean, this is why they created the cooperative. And it was more challenging because I had to do it over the phone. You know, I was calling them every day uh, in Guatemala. But finally, um, after a few months of, you know, like talking and all of this, um, they said, sure, come. Come to, you know, come to Guatemala and we'll work uh, with you. We'll see how, you know, how we can do this. But all of this is, again, like it just not happened overnight. Like I had to like, you know, go work. There was a lot of work internally in the museum as well that I had to do because for example, they said something that's very important to us is that we need to know what's going to happen to the stores. So I had to promise that all of our content, all of the exhibitions in the museum, they were all English and French. This one was the first one who was done in Spanish. So I could then bring it back to them and show them and that they could understand how their stories are going to be told. Um, I had to negotiate all of that with, you know, like the department of the museum and whatnot. They also said, how are we going to benefit? That was very important, right? And so I said, well, you know, we have, um, we have a boutique in the museum that sells products. Maybe we can sell your products. I said, yeah, that's interesting. And said, but if you do that, you need to commit yourself that you're going to be a regular client that you're not just going to sell at one time because otherwise you're going to create more harm this is some umbrella cooperatives and so they're going to go into debt buy material and all of that so there were so many different things that i had to do to make sure that you know this was going to be something that they could that they could benefit but that they could also trust as a project and so after like i said all this month of all this work we finally uh went to guatemala and start recording. And this is another thing too, oh, working with uh, the media producers who were doing the virtual reality. For example, they were saying, oh, when you go to Guatemala, go into like their houses and take film. And I said, we can't do that. I said, we are going to do what they want us to do and what we're invited to do. So we were working as well into how to develop the curatorial approach, what messages we were going to tell through this work, right? Through this virtual reality messages that were important to them. Like I said, we don't want the cooperatives to be romanticized. We don't want them, we don't want people to think that this is the solution to our problems because a lot of our women are still living under the poverty line. So, you know, all of these things were important, right? That all of these messages and all of these voices could lead as much as possible 
the development of the project. And we're going to go completely open to listen to what they want, right? And how they want to like, you know, be portrayed and what they want to be filmed. And so to be able to talk to as many different people as possible and then incorporate all of those voices as well and needs. Um, and so, yeah, here we were um, going across uh, the different villages in Guatemala, you know, like showing as well, you know, how the project was going to look like. It was really, really, you know, great to be able to, to build this relationship, to make these friendships and to be able to, to work like that. So um, this is how the exhibition looked like. Um, you can see again, you know, we had all the images. Again, the textiles, the artifacts that are shown were selected with the women. Um, they had significance as well. For example, uh, the color purple. I brought the designer with me from the museum because I wanted him to be inspiring to hear firsthand from the women about their stories. Um, the purple was important for the women as well. We went there during the Eastern uh, time, which was all purple everywhere. The, 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 the diamond here that you see was it's an, uh, it's an element of design that was important that you know we would not have been able to do if the designer wasn't there because they told us a story as well about the, tri the, the, the diamond, it's two triangles put together. This is a traditional pattern that it is done in the costume, in the traditional costume of the Ischil Triangle. Ischil, the Ischil Triangle, it's three towns that were really hit by the violence during the genocide. So it was really important as well to have those elements of the design incorporated in there. Um, again, the textiles, all of that, also something that was really important to us is was that we needed to pay all the women for their work, working. I mean, we are all getting paid, like I said, and people here are also experts of their own stories and of the knowledge. And so we needed to make sure that they were being paid. And here, because they're, we're dealing with artists, we needed to make sure that they will be paid the same as our artists here in Canada get paid. So this is, again, um, another thing that we did is that, you know, uh, I was able to bring Amparo and Oralia to the opening of the exhibition. And this was, again, it was kind of complicated to try to get it, uh, the museum to understand the programming department because they were like, yeah, yeah, we can bring them and then they can do like some weaving demonstration. And I was like, no, they're not props. They're gonna be here because they're the experts of their story and they will tell their story. And so, you know, and, and oh, it was it was amazing to have them in, in, in Winnipeg and Canada and talking about their story and then being the ones opening the exhibition and telling all of that and then being able to see how we were telling the stories because that was important to them. They became like mini celebrities, you know, like, oh, and it was beautiful because also the people from the Guatemalan community in Winnipeg, they were coming and knocking at the museum's door and we were able to connect them as well with indigenous women uh, from Canada. So it was, it was really, really a great um, experience to do that. And this was the first exhibition. It was so well received that it was the first exhibition that the museum, um, that became the first traveling exhibition for the museum, the Senate of Canada asked for it to come to Ottawa. So we brought it there. It went also to a university in there. And then again, we were able to send it to Guatemala with the help of the Canadian embassy. And we presented it at the museum of the traje typical of the traditional costume, because we wanted again, to be able to show it in Guatemala so the women over there could also see, you know, the work. I, I was able to advocate with the museum. And so I was able to go back to Guatemala after the exhibition had closed or ended and to visit every village again, all those 12 villages. So they're seeing all the women, how their virtual reality looked like and how their stories were told. I wanted to finish with this because it is important, like I said, that when we engage into this project that we don't become, uh, we just don't part a shoot into these communities and then we disappear and we leave. Every year I go back because it's important and we're still into i mean we talk like you know all the time through like basic social media with the women because it is important it is important that we continue these relationships for example after i left the museum and i, w I moved to sweden i went back and they said you know since you left the museum has disappeared they're not answering our emails they stopped selling our products so that's part of you know like the things that we need to really be mindful so what i did is like i shamed them all over social media and then the museum said oh i'm sorry that was a mistake we did not mean to and you know continue but yeah this is this is you know it's important because like i said these are relationships of trust that you build and once you build this relationship you can't break them and it is important because this is also what you you know that you will be able to show other communities when you're working with them that you care that you're not just there to take that story, 
and to appropriate it and to tell it, but you're there because you want to make sure that this community is going to benefit from it. Um, and to me, that is what decolonizing our practices in our sector uh, also means. So I want to end with that.